Hello, everyone. Welcome to this event put on by The Logic about cybersecurity. Welcome to our loyal subscribers. Welcome to the people who are new to The Logic and have been attracted by the, the subject or the excellent panelists we have coming up for you. Uh, if you are new to The Logic, I'll tell you just a little bit about us. We're an independent digital news publication. We focus on business and technology, the economy, and innovation in Canada. Uh, everything from EVs to innovation in agriculture to fintech to cybersecurity, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, if you subscribe, you get access to our daily newsletter and our feature reporting, our insider Slack channel, uh, our subscriber-only events, uh, which we also do typically monthly, and uh, our reporters, like me, uh, to ask questions, follow up on our stories, tell us what we ought to be paying attention to. We are grateful for every one of our subscribers and everyone who is just curious about us. Uh, I am David Reevely. I am an Ottawa reporter. There are a few of us in Ottawa. We have bureaus across the country. I am coming to you from the middle of a nasty storm, uh, which I think everyone here is hoping does not last very much longer. I'm sorry if you are hearing thunder or uh, the sound of hail hitting the, the window that I'm sitting next to. Um, a few notes just before we get going. Uh, one is this is supposed to be an interactive event. Uh, I ask you to ask questions uh, so that we can focus this conversation on the things that you want us to talk about and uh, the questions that you want answered. There are a couple of options. Uh, you can write in the chat or use the Q&A function at the bottom right of your screen. This event is free because it is sponsored by TELUS. Uh, we are very grateful for their support in this. I want to thank our partner. Um, and to kick us off, we will have some remarks from Lee Tynan, who is uh, from TELUS's online security department. She's the, the director of it, in fact. She has extensive experience in both business and consumer segments, and she's been for over 17 years, been supporting a very comprehensive online security solution. She's focused on ensuring all Canadians are able to easily protect their devices, their online privacy, and most importantly, their identities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lee for a few minutes. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, I think it is fantastic that you are all here today to learn about new advancements in cybersecurity threats, including the presence of AI powered cyber attacks. Uh, our world is changing. Today, we're gonna to talk about the current cybersecurity landscape and the public's perception of their level of rich risk, which is often very different from reality. Uh, the multitude of proactive measures that we can all take to protect ourselves online, as well as looking at why extensive end user security awareness is more important than ever. Our panelists will share how Canadians can implement robust security practices, leverage secure technologies, and stay informed about the latest threats and best practices. As Dave mentioned, I'm Lee Tynan. I'm the director of TELUS Online Security, and I'm thrilled to be here to kick off this insightful, <coughs> excuse me, and timely discussion as being cyber aware is more important than ever before. At TELUS, our mission is to improve the lives of Canadians through the power of technology, and that is no different when it comes to online security. Over the last several years, I have witnessed the stark rise in online fraud, and I am incredibly passionate about educating Canadians on how to protect themselves. To put this into perspective, losses reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre reached an all-time high in 2022 of 538, 530 million. This represents a 38% increase from the previous year, but the really stunning piece is that is with only an estimated 5% of victims actually filing a report. So without a doubt, the losses are much higher. And as many of you know from working in the tech space, our lives have become increasingly digital and with more information being shared online than ever before. Unfortunately, fraudsters have also noticed this and they are capitalizing on this opportunity, constantly innovating to find new ways to scam Canadians. You know, I remember when you could spot a phishing email from a mile away. The Nigerian prince wanted to send you, um, wanted to send you money. Right. As you know, it's not so simple anymore. Cybersecurity comes down to protecting your personal information from falling into the wrong hands. 
On the flip side, the cyber criminals are doing anything and everything that they can to get access to your information. Uh, they're looking for the information that's going to help them gain access to your accounts and impersonate you in things like credit applications. And the part that we really need to work at helping Canadians understand is even if you do everything right, our data is stored with all the different companies that we've ever engaged with. So all it takes is for one of those companies to be breached and your information is exposed. <clears throat> And as we often see in the news, no organization is immune to data breaches. Even large, sophisticated companies are at risk. And our goal at TELUS Online Security is to help make everyone's online experience safer. When it comes to the workplace, defense against cyber threats isn't solely the responsibility of the company itself. You know, with, with the advent of working from home, working remotely and, and bringing your own device, our workplace has changed. It's no longer in four walls. And so it's really important that all empo employees um, understand that they are a critical piece of that cybersecurity puzzle. We need to adopt the same simple practices that we follow, we had followed in the workplace in our personal lives and really extend that to our personal devices. Um, and our panelists are going to dive into their top tips for individuals to help protect themselves against fraud. But some of my personal quick tips, and they're very simple. Number one, always ensure you have the most up-to-date software on your computer or mobile device. They are there to patch vulnerabilities. Passwords. 73% of, of individuals reuse passwords across multiple different sites. And that is one of the most simple things that we can do. Create unique and complex passwords to protect yourself. And I would also encourage you to use a password manager because often it's overwhelming the number of passwords. And we also need to lean in and embrace two-factor authentication. Most people feel like it's a pain, but it really is there to protect you. Using a VPN. We use a VPN all day, often in our business lives, and we go into our personal lives and don't think about it. It's equally as important to, to prevent our online activity from being seen um, and keep our information safe and, and also not trusting public Wi-Fi connections because they're not they're public. They are just that they're public. So if you're going to be using public Wi-Fi, be behind a VPN. And lastly, if you haven't done a dark web scan, do one. Knowing your identity has been compromised is the first step at getting it back. We offer a free dark web scan at telus.com slash dark web. And if you subscribe to Telus Online Security, we actually proactively monitor the dark web for your personal information and notify you if it's found. So at the end of the day, what's going to help or what's going to be the biggest impact to helping Canadians, you know, stay more cyber aware? It's education. It's discussions like this. You know, most Canadians are concerned about cybercrime, but they don't know where to start. You know, we set up cameras in our homes uh, to see what's happening. We, if we ride a bike or drive a car, we lock it up. And yet arguably our most valuable possession, our identity, we forget to protect. So to be more aware of the of the threats that are out there, you got to educate yourselves. And, and ultimately, it's about layers of security. And that's where TELUS Online Security comes in. We provide those additional layers. We prevent threats from happening. We notify you if you may be at higher risk. And should you fall victim to fraud, we are there with a dedicated restoration specialist and reimbursement coverage for those identity theft-related expenses. With 24-7 live support, you are never dealing with this alone. So bottom line, you know, we are spending more time online than ever before, and cyber criminals are also getting smarter, especially with the emergence of new AI tools. Cyber crime is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in the world, so it's essential that we take proactive measures to protect ourselves from the ever-evolving threats. I often say cyber criminals have upped their game, and it's time we up ours too. So thank you so much for tuning in. We have an impressive panel of cybersecurity experts joining us today to share their experience, knowledge, and expertise from both the private sector and the public sector. I hope you leave here feeling empowered by their insight on how to stay cyber safe. Back to you, Dave. Thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah, if, if nothing else, having your identity ripped off or an account broken into can just be a colossal pain in the butt. I had my uh, my Twitter account stolen out from under me. It's a number of years ago now uh, by someone who broke in and didn't do anything with it except change the password and then I couldn't use it. And it took an entire day of dealing with Twitter to get it back. Uh, and that was when they had 
people dedicated to fixing this kind of thing. I was reading something this morning about James Moore, the former cabinet minister, who had something similar happen to him. And apparently it took him three weeks uh, involving multiple day waits to get somebody at Twitter's attention. Uh, and these are, you know, I think he was industry minister. This is someone who is familiar with this stuff. Uh, and if it can happen to him, it can happen to just about anybody. Uh, I will bring in our panel now, uh, who will tell you things much smarter than the things I can tell you. Uh, we have Ritesh Kotak, who's a technology and cybersecurity analyst. He's dedicated his career to exploring how emerging technology will impact society. He's a lawyer licensed in Ontario, and he practices in privacy, cybersecurity, and emerging technology. We have Laura Payton from the Communications Security Establishment, Canada's national uh, cyber spying and cyber defense agency. She joined CSE in 2018 after more than a decade in journalism. And I should say, in the interest of full disclosure, we worked together at the Ottawa Citizen once upon a time, though longer ago than I care to admit. Uh, her focus at CSE now is on clearly communicating advice and guidance from CSE's Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, so Canadians can apply it to their everyday lives to better protect themselves. And Ian L. Patterson is an entrepreneur with more than 10 years of experience in leading and commercialising technology companies focused on data analytics and machine learning. As CEO of Pluralock now, Ian has successfully built and grown the company, leading to its successful listing on the TSX Venture Exchange. Welcome to our panelists. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I think I will start uh, with a question for Laura from CSE. Uh, you're with a, a defense agency. You answer to the, the defense minister, cybersecurity as a, as a, a, a national priority. What's CSE's interest in my password hygiene? Well, it all ties into uh, the security of Canada, David. And one of our big goals is to ensure that Canada is the most cyber secure nation because there are, unfortunately, so many threats. Um, we lay them all out, actually, in the Cyber Center's 2023-24 National Cyber Threat Assessment. It is a little bit scary to read. It might keep you up at night, but uh, it's definitely important to inform ourselves. Um, there's a range of threats, and even if they're impacting you personally, uh, that lowers all of our cybersecurity. Um, certainly, we also all need to be aware because uh, personal cybersecurity, sorry, the personal knowledge can impact our industry sectors. Um, you know, everyone's working uh, in their roles at work, and it only takes one um, uh, moment, one, one lapse, and you tap a bad link, or you're not educated enough about some of the implications of uh, lack of security, and then that can affect uh, industry sectors um, as well as your personal cybersecurity. So there's a, a, a potential national vulnerability uh, if, if people are not paying close enough attention to their own cybersecurity. People can worm their way, bad people can worm their way into systems that way. Yeah, and I mean, you know, cybercrime we have assessed is is the um, threat that Canadians are most likely to face, the cyber threat they're most likely to face. And so uh, we are more likely to face it in our personal lives than anywhere else. And it all goes to making Canada less cyber secure if we're not aware of this stuff. So, uh, Ian Patterson, first of all, tell us a little bit about Pluralock and, and what it does, just so we know where you're coming from. Well, David, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. So Pluralock, we're, we're really focused on helping our, our clients, who are both government as well as commercial organizations, uh, realize least privilege. So security historically has been uh, a, a divide where we, we assume that the, the bad guys are, are external. Uh, we, we implement firewalls, and then we just assume everybody inside the company or inside the organization is safe. Now what the industry is, is moving to is this idea that you really can't trust anybody. You might have heard terms like zero trust. Pluralock is really at the forefront of, of enabling uh, least privilege or zero trust on behalf of our clients. We do that both through our, our solution provider group as well as we have unique uh, artificial intelligence that allows us to recognize people based on their unique keystroke behavior in a matter of seconds. So uh, we come at it from both a software angle as well as a, a trusted partner angle. So you have a, uh, one of your offerings is a, a system for telling who I am by how I type or who is sitting at my computer logged in as me, checking whether they are typing the way I usually type? Correct. It, it was actually a lot more impressive uh, before, before uh, ChatGPT took the world by storm and, and pointed out at what, what is possible using AI. But yes, that, that, that is correct. We have, 
we have six patents on this technology um, and it's it's the the, the key differentiator and, and really I think it's an indication of where the industry is going uh, the the defenders and the attackers are both leveraging AI in, in very different ways which I'm sure we'll get into during the conversation mm -hmm. um, uh, to to further their own respective goals do you find, I, I'll give you some context for this question. I was watching a House of Commons committee hearing last week, actually, with someone from CSE who said that they detect and fend off between, I think it was 4 billion and 7 billion probes of Canadian government systems or attacks of one kind or another on Canadian government systems every day. Uh, when it comes to uh, corporate cyber vulnerabilities, are the attacks that you typically see more related to you know, trying to break into a computer system um, using programming techniques, technical hacks, or do, are they focused on individuals and, and their behavior? So it's a very good question. I think the, the bad guys don't play by any rules. And so uh, certainly, you know, those of us who sell antivirus uh, software, we would love all of the attacks to be uh, virus in nature because we have we have products that solve that. Um, you know, I think the I want to build on what Laura was saying, though, you know, the, the bad guys will use any and all means available to them to get in. Um, we see uh one of the most common uh, attacks, which is actually more, more of a scam than, than a hack, but one of the most common attacks uh, targeting businesses is gift card scams. The way this works is the bad guys will typically reach out to a new employee, somebody who's junior in the organization, maybe only been there a couple of weeks. They'll get a text message uh, to, to that person's phone and it'll say something along the lines of, hey, it's the boss, it's the CEO, it's your manager. I'm on a conference call. I need you to send uh, a gift card to this, this customer right away. We've, we've just, we, something's gone wrong. We need to make it up to them. Send this right away. Just, just do it. Just buy it. More often than not, uh, those individuals will actually purchase the gift card. It'll be a couple hundred dollars. It'll, they'll send it to the attacker. And then hours later, or potentially days later, they'll, they'll go to get it reimbursed. And obviously that, that it was the bad guy. It wasn't actually the, the authorized, um, uh, wasn't the authorized person who asked them to do that. So this is an extremely common attack. And most people don't want to talk about it because they, they're embarrassed. They, they, fell for, they fell for one of these types of attacks, but it's happening all the time. Um, and, and this is just one example of the type of, of threat facing uh, Canadians today. That I think happened to me just after I started at the Logic. I didn't fall for it, but uh, yeah, the the boss said, "Hey, you know, I need you to 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 do something really quickly." And I thought that's weird. And it turns out that about once a month, he has to send something to the company Slack saying, "Still not doing that. Still not doing that." But I guess it only takes one person to fall for it. You're in big trouble. Um, Ritesh, uh, big picture. How can businesses and and people uh, who oversee them from the C-suites, what are some of the big things they need to think about when they're uh, trying to, to protect themselves from these sorts of cyber attacks? Can I give you a one word answer if that's OK? Um, yeah, it, uh, well, no, I'm going to want you to elaborate on it. <laughs> well, I'll elaborate sorry. on it. But but it's culture at the end of the day. For me, it's uh, what do you mean by culture? Front and center. Um, you need to ingrain a culture of cybersecurity within the organization. Here's the best way to think about this is let's equate this to health and safety. Uh, 20 years ago, it would be, if I want to go onto a construction site, it's like, do I really got to wear PPE? Do I really got to wear steel toe boots? Um, and we would think, uh, you know, is this really necessary? Today, we wouldn't think twice before ensuring that we have the proper PPE before going onto a construction site. It just wouldn't cross your mind. Well, I think cybersecurity is today where health and safety was 20 years ago, and ingraining that into the culture um, is absolutely paramount. So just building on what the other speakers have talked about, um, the most dangerous thing that you're probably going to do today is not cross the street, probably not drive a car. It's open email. Uh, think about all the threats, the links, the, the, how sophisticated it's becoming. I know we're going to get into the whole conversation around artificial intelligence and how that plays into this new threat landscape. But these threats are going to keep evolving. What we're talking about today is not what the is not what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. It's clearly not what we were talking about last week. So all the more reason to build a culture of cybersecurity awareness. Uh, Making If people find something suspicious, they report it. Um, they know who to turn to. You got proper policies and procedures in place and you do training exercises, tabletop exercises, simulating breaches. So people are comfortable. If you don't do that, 
uh, you're not going to be able to solve this at an at a high level from an organizational view. So what, what would a, a, a table talk exercise like that look like? Sure. Um, I actually recently did one and it was uh, really interesting what we what we found uh, with this particular organization is we we said it's three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and the or and all of a sudden you get this email um, saying help SOS our systems are locked out you're the C suite so you get something from uh, your IT department I think we even said it's not an email it's a text message because email servers are down so you go and you turn on your computer you can't get access to anything what do you do and we kind of work through a scenario of who do you contact? Uh, what policies and procedures are in place? How do you deal with the comm strategy? How do you deal with the internal notification to your employees and staff? And how do you deal with external communication as well? Because your clients and your customers are now wondering, um, what's going on here? How come I can't access my account? But they can't get a hold of you at the same time. What are the regulatory requirements, the reporting requirements? These are all things that you want to practice beforehand and because um, the worst time to you know, learn to fly a plane is when it's in the air. Another, just another analogy to think about is if we were to equate this to, um, again, something in the physical world, let's say fire drills. Um, let's think about this holistically. In your house, in your office, you got fire alarms. That's your detection system. Um, they start ringing. That's your notification system. Um, if there is a fire, you go outside, you call 911. They show up. Um, they deal with the situation. You probably have insurance, policies, procedures in place of what to do um, in the in the case of there's if there was a an actual fire now let's flip that around forget fire alarms it's the cyber alarms that go off uh, we practice fire drills but we don't really practice cyber drills and how do we how do we build that into the culture of an organization and that's probably the, the best way to think about it by the way just to to, to build on what Wachesh was was saying you're always going to get the the hack or attack on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh, it's not going to be you know <laughs> Monday morning when you're bright eyed and bushy tailed. It's always they're always going to hit you when uh, when when the a, a thing that you're least likely to be able to to uh, fight fight it off. It's like the the phone scammer calling in the middle of the night with a security alert on your credit card and you're bleary eyed and not really in your right mind for it. Uh, Laura, what, what's CSE's view on how prepared Canadians are for this? How seriously do we take this as a, as a nation? I think we can always be more prepared, um, but we do have public opinion research that shows that Canadians feel they're prepared and they feel that their neighbours or their friends and colleagues are not as well prepared. Um, so while they feel like they're not going to be a target of cybercrime or that they have a, a lower risk for it, um, it's only about half of people who know some sort of basic cyber things like when you're shopping online to use a, a site that you trust or to look for the little lock. Um, and so there are lots of ways that people in general can improve their cyber security. Um, a lot of the ways that, that Lee talked about in the introduction, for example. Um, so there's, there, there's space for us to grow as, as a country and to do better. Um, education is a big part of that and being aware, you know, this is a sophisticated audience watching today. Um, and so they're probably already ahead of the game because they're probably doing a lot of the things that we would recommend. Uh, but certainly if, if you know, your family members or your colleagues at work aren't taking the same precautions, then that, that lowers um, the cybersecurity level for all of us. It sounds like, though, for most people, hacks are, are things that happen to somebody else, not something that is likely to happen to them. Yeah, it's funny because they do report that they've at least been targeted, but they still don't see it as a risk. And so making people aware that really, again, cybercrime is the most prevalent uh, uh, cyber threat to people in Canada, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, industry or, or critical infrastructure. Um, but it's cybercrime. And so... Um, just like the examples that we've given of like the phone call in the middle of the night or the text message, um, the email that you open, um, all of those things, like they, these are criminals who have no scruples, um, as we like to say, like they don't care and they will target anyone. Um, and so we all need to be aware of that. Uh, Laura, is the, the bigger threat, I, I'm not sure how you define the word bigger here, but is the, is the greater threat from cyber criminals or from state sponsored attempts to invade our systems? For Canadians, it's generally uh, cyber criminals. Um, mm -hmm. 
if, if I think my way through the national cyber threat assessment, certainly there is a strategic threat to Canada from state actors. Um, and certainly uh, people have seen cases of, um, for example, human rights activists targeted in Canada by other states. Uh, mm -hmm. So those are things we need to be aware of um, so that people can protect themselves. But absolutely, it's cybercrime. So then, uh, Ian, what tends to get people's attention uh, if they've been cruising along thinking this is something that happens to other people? Yeah, getting hacked gets attention. Um, <laughs> and and I, I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but the reality is as a vendor, if I'm going to, to talk to an organization, the thing that I'm listening for is to, is to hear if they had a cyber incident recently or if one of their near peers competitors have had a cyber incident recently that's the thing that that really gets attention it's challenging if you're an executive if you're if you're a, a member on the board to allocate funds to something that you haven't seen before or or you haven't experienced yet in the past you, you end up having a, a difficult time trying to justify well is this really going to happen or is this is this an insurance policy and you know it's never happened to me it happens to other people um, but when when there is an incident or when there's been a near miss or when there's been a, an incident with somebody else in your industry, somebody else that, that you're, you're very familiar with, that actually does tend to to get people's attention. Um, now, that's that's a broad generalization. What I would say is that um, over the last several years, uh, I've actually noticed a shift in in both awareness as well as action. Um, partly that's driven, I think, by by the, the realization that these attacks are hitting everybody in every industry of companies of every size. Um, but it's also partly due to some of the regulatory pressure um, that's coming in. So in Canada, um, we have bills C-26 and C-27, which are gonna change a little bit about how companies deal with, um, with the use of AI as well as with cybersecurity. It's gonna come with some mandatory reporting requirements should there be uh, cybersecurity uh, incidents or breaches. Um, this is sort of coming on the back of, of even GDPR in Europe or CCPA, which is a data privacy standard in, in California. There's more regulatory pressure now being placed upon businesses to safeguard both data and systems. Data largely because we're, we're seeing evidence of data breaches in the news practically every day. Um, but what we also saw in the last couple of years um, is is just major critical infrastructure systems that are that were getting taken offline. Think about Colonial Pipeline. I mean, this was this was a year or two ago, and as a result of one pipeline that got taken offline due to ransomware, within days you had people filling up plastic bags with gasoline, afraid that they weren't going to be able to to fuel their car. So this this is really a, a massive impact on both individuals as well as people, and and we're starting now to see a little bit of change, but but I don't think it's it's enough yet. We are very shortly going to move into the, the the cool new frontiers of and scary new frontiers of how technology is changing things. But what's the um, the the number one or top two tips for individuals? I'll go around to each of you. The thing that if you're not doing it, you should start doing this as soon as we're done talking here. Uh, Ritesh, uh, I thought you're going to give me more time to think about my top two tips. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, I would say the number one tip is uh, do your backups, uh, regular backups that are off-site just in case you do get hit with something. At least you have that and you're not being held at ransom. I'm always surprised by see hearing from organizations that, yeah, they did a backup, but they left it on the same system. Um, and, and those servers got hit as well. Uh, so, you know, we, when we start talking about ransomware and getting your systems back up and running, which I still think ransomware is one of the, the number one threats facing um, Canadian organizations, um, the backups, right? A lot of these high-tech crime, low-tech solutions is kind of my, kind of my motto. And the second one, um, again, it, it just falls into that cyber hygiene, uh, just building on uh, the low high-tech crime, low-tech solutions, the changing of your passwords, the multi-factor authentications, enabling account notifications, um, thinking before you clicking, kind of all that. And I grouped it in because I couldn't think of two. So those are, uh, those are, I guess that's my one and my one bucket. Yeah. It's, it's the basics. And as you say, you know, low tech solutions to high tech problems. Uh, Laura, top, top, top tip or top two tips. Yeah, I would say this as opposed to passwords, you don't necessarily need to remember, um, you know, all the special characters and numbers. If you 
pull together a string of unrelated words uh, for a passphrase. That makes it pretty complicated for somebody to try to, to crack. Um, and also, I would say public Wi-Fi. Like, this is something I think about a lot in Ottawa, right? You can have, like, a low-level job and have access to some pretty sensitive information. Um, so don't be using public Wi-Fi uh, without a VPN. If you are going to be discussing something sensitive, don't do your banking on, you know, the Wi-Fi at the coffee shop. Um, there, yeah, it's it's like Ritesh said, like low tech solutions. They're so simple, and if you're doing those things, you're ahead of the game. Ian, top tip, top two. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to give you a three point plan, uh, and so point number one is use unique passwords everywhere. One of the most common ways that bad guys are able to compromise accounts is that they will uh, they will steal a password from one site, let's say LinkedIn or Dropbox. And they will test that same password with your email address on other sites. And if they're able to get in, then they get in. So you can combat that. You can defend against that uh, by using a different password everywhere. So that's point number one. Point number two is with that amount of passwords, um, and it can be passphrases. I think Laura actually makes a great point that it should be passphrases where, where possible. Use a password manager of some kind. Um, now, the, the one that you use is less important as long as you use one. Um, it could be one password. It could be LastPass. They did have a security breach uh, recently. Uh, it could be the um, the built-in one on on Apple, um, or it actually could be a Post-it note. Um, if there, there's actually a lot of value in, in having a physical password manager, um, in in some respects, this is actually very secure and and goes back to to advice back from the 90s uh, from from certain luminaries around uh, a good good password hygiene. So. Use unique passwords, use a password manager. And then the third thing, and this is what R R Ritesh was, was alluding to, is use uh, either two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. So this is where you have something that you know, like a password, something that you have, like a, a, a device or a, a token or USB stick, and something that you are. So that would be like a form of biometrics. And so you want at least two out of those three things to protect uh, certainly the password manager that you use, but also ideally um, all, all of the sites. So if you can do those three things, you dramatically reduce the, the uh, common attacks uh, that, that can do damage to you. And this, by the way, is, is applicable not only to individuals, but also for business users. One of the things that we found um, is most effective in, in getting employees to be more security conscious is you actually teach them how to be secure themselves outside of the business. So if you can teach them how to be secure, if you can teach them good password hygiene and, and the use of, of password managers, or if, even if you provide a password manager to them and their family, you actually do a lot of good in getting them to be a security advocate as opposed to a security obstacle um, when you're thinking about securing your actual business. I'm going to take a, an audience question. They've been building up a little bit, but there's one that's directly relevant to, to this. So I'm going to put it to you, Ian, and it's about password managers. Uh, I used LastPass because to keep track of my wide variety of unique passwords, and then LastPass started dripping out news about their security breach. How do you convince people that putting all their eggs in one basket that way is a good idea if it turns out some of the baskets aren't that great? So the, the, the comparison that I would offer is um, how many times have you heard of a password manager getting hacked? And, and I think what we can say is maybe one or two, arguably if, if the last pass incident was one or two breaches, but effectively that's one or two. And then compare that to how many data breaches do you hear or do you see in the news every day? So if security is always a trade-off. You're always trading off one versus another. The, the, the trade-off that you're making with password managers is that you're trading the better security overall of using unique passwords for each site against the centralization risk that if that thing gets compromised, everything else is, is compromised. The, the other, I guess the other way to frame this comparison is if you have the same password on all sites, if any one of those sites gets compromised, the attackers have access to all sites versus if you use different passwords with all sites, the attacker, even if they compromise one site, they're not going to be able to access the other sites. So there is still a little bit of risk. However, it's better overall to still use some sort of centralized password manager. Now, again, if you have concerns about LastPass, great news. There, there's a ton of other options. I mean, there are, there are offline options where you actually don't use the cloud even. 
Um, and so that's a little bit more secure in, in some respects as compared to LastPass, which was some centralized in the cloud. Um, but again, the, you know, going back to the, the post-it note idea or, or even just having something, uh, a list of passwords stored in your wallet or in your purse, um, if you're concerned about cloud centralization, you can actually have an offline version of this. The, the, the old password advice, again, going back to the 90s was, if somebody steals your wallet, are they really going to uh, go after the, the password that maybe doesn't even have a, a website address listed beside it? Or are they just going to go after your credit cards and your, your debit cards and the cash that's in there? And so again, it's, it's about trade-offs. Try, try and identify what is the risk you're trying to protect against. In this case, what I'm advocating is defend against the risk of password reuse because password stuffing attacks or password reuse attacks, these are, these are unbelievably common and happen all the time defend against that and, uh, and and then have a plan in place or, or be able to mitigate the, the risk of that centralization of passwords. And just building on that one, one, one quick thing, it's if you have that multi-factor authentication enabled, even if that password gets compromised, there's still additional friction um, for so these hackers just won't be able to to get in. So it's a combination of stuff. But yeah, agree. Do not recycle passwords, period. Ritesh, I'm going to stick with you, uh, and I'm going to ask you about AI and the effect that it has on on the cybersecurity world. Uh, AI is a big basket of things, uh, but I think what it means to the average person now is tools like ChatGPT, large language models. Since they burst forth into the the, the mainstream site, how does technology like that change the cybersecurity game? Well, I think it significantly changes the cybersecurity game. And it's actually interesting that we're talking about, you know, and there's been some mention of ChatGPT. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner yesterday actually just launched an investigation into uh, ChatGPT. So it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what that investigation entails. I think it has to do with consent and disclosure of information. But uh, and, but the thing is, is that people are talking about it. This is uh, one thing that's front and center. Um, it's really taken the world by uh, the world by storm. And how can it actually impact um, users? So I don't think of this as just chat GPT. I think of this as the broader topic of generative AI, where we're actually able to generate content, we're able to generate images, we're able to generate voices. There's been tons of uh, examples where individuals have used uh, AI voice synthesizers to mirror someone's particular voice and say phrases. So if we think about um, biometric hacking, um, for example, this is going to be something that's going to be a real challenge. I actually called into a institution. I'm not going to name the institution um, because then you're going to use my voice and hack into my accounts. But uh, I literally was talking to somebody um, and they said, uh, Mr. Kotak, you've been uh, authenticated uh, using our voice identification system. I was like, great. I didn't even know you were using my voice for identification. So that's a whole other issue. But if you can start mirroring that now, and I don't, you know, I haven't been able to dig into this, uh, to the specifics, but that in itself becomes problematic. And just like with any technology, you got the good, you got the bad, and you got the evil. Um, there's definitely good when it comes, if we look at AI from a cybersecurity standpoint, think about uh, the ability to identify part particular vulnerabilities. Um, if you're doing your red team exercises uh, internally, seeing what vulnerabilities might be, cyber vulnerabilities within your organization, um, responding to cyber incidents, um, generating particular messaging and, and, and documents, you know, all these things AI can definitely help with. But then again, it, it there are it, there is that potential of it being of it being weaponized. I saw a demo. I don't think it's ready for mainstream yet, um, which is a good thing. Uh, but I did see a demo where um, you literally put in a, a site address, and this AI will literally or this this program will literally call crawl through the site and um, list all the particular vulnerabilities. And we are getting to the point where generative AI will be able to generate code. Um, ChatGPT doesn't allow you to use its platform to generate malicious code, um, but there is going to be AI that's going to come down in the future, which will. So imagine you just type in a website, it scans the website, finds any particular uh, vulnerability or plugins that uh, haven't been updated where vulnerability actually exists and that's been documented and then allows you to essentially hack into that website. 
Um, this is literally the world that we're living in um, right now, and AI is making it better from a protection standpoint, but also creating net new vulnerabilities. So we're kind of in this real weird position right now. Does it make phishing easier or harder? Easier, easier. I think. E yeah, easier. Definitely, <laughs> it makes it easier. Um, and phishing, you know, from an email standpoint, yeah, you can uh, further tailor messages. You can make these uh, emails. Some of them are really good. Even I have to do a double take sometimes uh, and be like, wow, okay, this um, this is interesting uh, that they're using this particular technique. Um, I've even seen uh, emails that were written, uh, and I've checked the IP address, and I know it's not an exact way of reverse engineering where that email was generated from, uh, coming from particular countries, but the way that that email was written I looked at that and said, well, wait a second, you actually understand local slang. Um, you know, it, it has that local context to it. So it makes it that much more difficult to decipher fact from fiction. And then we're, it's not only emails, we're seeing this in, uh, in text messages, uh, which I think is through the roof right now. Um, and it's extremely annoying. And we're also seeing this now with phone calls, uh, whether it's be robocalling systems and on the other end, there's a, it's a bot, it's not a human being. Um, it's getting more and more realistic. Ian, what's your take on the impact of AI on cybersecurity generally? Well, I think that, uh, so first, I agree with everything Ritesh is saying. Um, uh, I, I think he's, he's going to sound more convincing, and certainly with a microphone that looks like that, he's, he's going to appear more, more credible. Um, so I, I can't compete with that. What I would say is that all of the uh, attacks and the, um, the tools that Ritesh was mentioning have been, a, have been around for a couple of years. So automated vulnerability testing has, has been around for a couple of years, and it's possible to, to run a tool at a website and, and get the vulnerabilities. The key difference now is that it's a whole lot cheaper and easier to do. So at, from a really big picture, as an AI guy, I, I always look at AI as inherently deflationary. AI, it's like automation. It's going to enable more people to do more with less than they were able to do before. So previously, it was difficult and it was expensive. It was, it was actually expensive in time and money to conduct really good quality attacks. And so that's why spear phishing attacks or attacks that required a lot of uh, effort to put in were less frequent because they were expensive to do. I think the big change now is that these, these tools are much more uh, commonplace. And so even the less sophisticated adversaries of which there are more of are now able to, to run these types of attacks and, and run these campaigns at a much larger scale. So the net net here is that the bad guys are getting more tools, better tools. It's gonna to be easier for them to conduct more convincing uh, attacks um, and, and that's that's the key difference. I think the other the other thing though that I would uh, that that I'm, I'm predicting um, is that we're going to see a, a large uptick. It, and to be clear, we're, we've already in the last three months we've already seen a massive uptick in um, in in phishing campaigns. I think Darktrace actually just came out with with a statistic that we've seen a 135 percent increase in social engineering attacks from January to February, just as a result of ChatGPT um, coming out. So, so I think that's one thing. The, the thing that I am expecting and the thing that I am predicting is that we're actually gonna see multimodal uh, phishing attacks. So it's not just gonna be text, but it's going to be deep fake impersonation of voice. It's gonna be deep fake impersonation of video, potentially even live in real time. Meaning, imagine if you get a voice memo that sounds like the boss and says, hey, Going back to our earlier example, hey, go buy this gift card. How likely is that new employee going to be to check and verify was it actually them? If it's a live phone call, if it's a live video and it looks and sounds like that person, how likely are they going to be to stop and actually check and try and verify that communication? So that's what I anticipate coming down the pike as a result of these new generative AI tools that we have at our disposal. I think if I can add something uh, that we haven't really touched on yet, that is also a low tech protection. It's take a break when you get something like this, like a, a call that sounds like it's from the boss, but like maybe you never get a call from the boss. Take a beat and pause. Um, like to be honest, this happened to me last week. I got scammed and I uh, let somebody into my access to my credit card. And I immediately was like, wait, that was really dumb. Uh, and locked the card and then in penance spent five and a half hours on the phone with the bank. But like these scammers are clever and they're getting all these tools that will help them. Um, so like, let's take a breath. Don't be rushed into sharing information. Don't be rushed into making a purchase or sending money. Like 
if it is an emergency, it can still wait five minutes for you to kind of do your verifications um, and uh, avoid, um, you know, falling for the trap the way I did. Um, the other thing I would say is I forgot to mention earlier that we have a really great tool available for people to use on their phones. Uh, we partnered with uh, CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registry Authority, so the people who you register your .ca domains with, and they actually have incorporated uh, the Cyber Center threat information into um, an, app, an app that you can download on your phone. And if you are going to go, you tap on a link and you're about to go to a malicious site that we're aware of, it's blocked. Uh, Canadian Shield blocks it. And so that's like an added layer of protection um, on top of being aware and watching and just knowing what you're looking out for. I can't hear David. I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, no, nope. okay, I'm sorry. back. Um, the advice to take a breath sounds like it connects to Ritesh's uh, talk about cyber resilience and having a culture of cyber resilience. You know, being a boss who says, I would rather you took five minutes to and, and checked with me three times rather than, you know, send money to bad guys once or let one bad guy into our into our system. That's part of that that culture that you were talking about, Ritesh. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, you take a, you just got to stop and take a breath, right? And, uh, and, and as, as my fellow panelists have mentioned, that verification is absolutely essential. Yes, this is the hackers and fraudsters know this, they add a sense of urgency, they make it seem that, you know, we got to do this, and we got to do this now. Uh, my heart goes out to I was, um, I was actually on a radio show and my heart went out to all the callers uh, this this 70 or 85 year old grandma called and said, uh, you know, uh, I got scammed out of $10,000. Uh, why did they get scammed? Because uh, they got a call and somebody pretending to be their grandson, who was in jail and needed bail money. And it was just, you know, the grandma was quick to provide the information, um, later realizing that, you know, clearly her grandson wasn't, uh, wasn't in jail. And, you know, her, the learning that came out of it was, um, I wish I just called in and verified but the hackers were the fraudsters were so convincing these are professionals they do this all day every day they try to get you at the time when you're most vulnerable they prey on vulnerable individuals um and it's getting even more uh, difficult but yes you know simple solution here stop take a breath um verify and then proceed it, building on ritesh's point we actually had an incident um uh, last week, uh, last weekend, actually. Um, and it was a situation I, I got a call uh, from somebody and this is this is actually pretty, pretty common. I, I tend to be the one who gets the call when there is an incident or cyber breach. Um, and it was their grandparent who had been scammed. Uh, the grandparent got a call uh, purporting to be the grandson who just got into a car wreck uh, and needed money to help pay for damages. But don't don't tell mom, a.k.a. the, the daughter because uh, they were trying to keep it under wraps. Um, I think he was out five to 10 grand um, before before law enforcement got involved. So unfortunately, it happens happens a lot. For me, it was they were pretending to be the bank saying, oh, your number's been stolen. We just need to lock it. Can you confirm a few things? Hmm. So they like, yeah, anyway. Yeah, they used cybersecurity against Against you. me. Yeah. It was yeah. almost like spear phishing. It was very accurate. Well, we, we had one situation where somebody literally went in, like stole mail from someone's mailbox right and then call then call the individual so you have the last four digits of their their credit card you know where they live you know their name you can it just makes it that much more convincing you know shred your shred your mail right i guess again simple solution uh might have and, and get your mail when it comes in have a locked mailbox solves that problem but yeah they figure out ways right yeah we throw our financial stuff in the fireplace when we're done with the paper um builds up over the summer but then it's all gone, gone come November, December. Uh, we have a, a couple questions that I want to get to about quantum. Um, and uh, I'll start with Ritesh and maybe go to Ian. Uh, quantum technology capacity you know, exponentially increases uh, computing power, not quite available yet for regular use, but then things like ChatGPT were not quite available for regular use until one day last fall they were. What preparations are you aware that we're making or what preparations should we be making for the arrival of quantum computing? Ritesh? I think understanding would be first uh, first and foremost. I think a lot of people just don't really understand the power of quantum and how it's going to be such a disruptor. So that to me would be would be front uh, front and center. Clearly, um, there are a lot, there's tons of positives that are going to come out of it. I actually 
was at a conference where they talked about homomorphic encryption um, and the power that uh, that would have. So essentially, the ability to encrypt data in real time still allow analysis to happen while protecting privacy. And they were talking about how quantum would allow us to take these large data sets, do some really interesting, interesting stuff. Some of it was way even over my head. I was like, okay, I have no idea what's, what, what you're talking about. But uh, the, the point the point was there is that this this is coming and we don't really have a mainstream strategy because there's a lack of understanding. Ian, thoughts on quantum? So so my two cents is that this is an extremely sexy topic uh, that really doesn't matter to most people right now. Um, and I think that what what the the three of us have all, actually the four of us have just articulated is within the last couple of weeks we've all had a, a very real. Uh, a financial impact as a result of scams that are taking place today. So my recommendation to people is be aware of quantum. My my 15 to 30 second pitch on quantum is this. Quantum represents a, tr a risk to traditional encryption. Eventually, we will need to move to post-quantum cryptography. The way to do that is that there will be a vendor that gets vetted and ultimately selected as having a post-quantum safe uh, form of crypto. We will have to adopt that. Uh, and then that will effectively be the, the remediation or the solve for the risk that quantum uh, faces. We're not there yet. Um, and there are absolutely hacks and attacks that are taking place today that we should be actively working on to, to defend against. The good news is that CSC has people working on those exact problems. They're working <laughs> with uh, NIST, the American Standards folks, on new um, standards of encryption. And so it's going to be well coordinated between Canada and the US. I am glad to hear that. I, They're very there's, smart a, people. A, <laughs> there's another question uh, that's sort of related to this, which is about the balance between individual responsibility and corporate institutional, you know, the responsibility of employers, the responsibility of of large companies like the the Telluses and the Rogerses and the and the big banks and whatnot. Do you think that we are striking the right balance in this? Or actually may, let me let me phrase that a little more sharply. Is the government requiring enough of the large institutions that that hold tons of data and might be vulnerable to these sorts of attacks. Uh, Ian, what do you think? I think this is this is a challenging environment. I, when when we're typically dealing with some sort of data breach or security incident, it's usually really not clear who is at fault or who is responsible for for cleaning up. I, I think it, it, it's a little bit more mature in financial fraud situations. Um, so generally speaking, if, if your credit card gets compromised and gets used by a bad guy, you as the uh, owner of that credit card, you're, you're for the most part, you're safe. Um, you simply get, you know, the, the charges get reversed or the, the bank takes care of that and you get a new card and, and kind of away, away you go. The same is not true uh, when it comes to data breaches, when it comes to security incidents. Um, and the the spectrum of parties that are involved uh, can be quite large. So if a company gets hacked, but it gets hacked by uh, by a risk that was uh, brought on to it as a result of a supplier. Um, and that supplier uh, maybe had poor password hygiene. And then you've got insurance involved. Into a, and if it's a nation state that caused it, there's, there's all these different um, uh, gray areas that can exist. So I think, I think it is challenging. And for the consumers who are effectively caught in the middle of this, um, I don't think that there is sufficient um, uh, visibility, number one, and, and it, I, I also don't think that there's sufficient recourse is the other. Now, I think that, um, that, that both the AI bill and the cyber bill that are, that are coming up in Canada um, and, and certainly similar uh, legislation and, and regulation coming into place uh, in the U.S. from CISA, the, the, um, uh, the governing body there, is, is moving more towards uh, transparency, breach reporting, um, and there's also, there's also started to be a little bit of a push for, um, for responsibilities to be placed upon software vendors. So in the United States, the, there was a recent executive order that started this conversation around uh, software vendors needing to own up to, the, to their, their portion of the responsibility as part of this ecosystem. But it's, it's still, I would characterize it as, as the Wild West right now. And I think that there's a lot of, of clarity that, that needs to be put in place. Ritesh, what do you think? about the, the balance that we strike. Yeah, just because you can do it, should you do it, um, I think is what comes front and center. And Brad Smith, who's the president and chief legal officer of Microsoft, gave a very interesting analogy. What he said was, doctors take a Hippocratic oath. 
Um, should coders do the same, that they won't use their powers for evil? Um, and, and should vendors do the same as well? Uh, yes, there is upcoming legislation, uh, Bill C-26, C-27. You'll need a cybersecurity plan. There'll be mandatory reporting for federally regulated organizations. We're creating a tribunal in this country, um, a privacy tribunal. Um, and there's going to be AI and data systems regulations coming down the pipe as well. Um, what it, what the exacts, we don't know yet because it's only its second reading um, in the House of Commons. Uh, but it will move, uh, you know, it's definitely going to change the privacy landscape. But just, but I, I get back to my point that the law, a lot of people think that that is the ceiling. It's the utmost that you got to do. I always say the law is actually the floor. It's the bare minimum you got to do to participate. Everything as a vendor that you do above that is a value add and the value creation you're giving to society. So yes, this will require um, a joint effort between vendors, between government, between citizens, all working together to solve this problem because this does not fall on one particular uh, stakeholder. Laurie, it would not be fair for me to put that question to you, but maybe a version of it is what help does CSE give to some of these big institutions and, and private companies that are storehouses of, of this data? Yeah, we have guidance for basically everybody you can think of on the Cyber Center website, cyber.gc.ca. Um, you can find guidance at the uh, industry level or for, for users, excuse me. <clears throat> and certainly on our Get Cyber Safe website, uh, getcybersafe.ca, there's lots and lots of info for, for people. Um, everything from how to avoid romance scams um, to, to, you know, using VPN. Um, so there's lots and lots of good information there. Um, and we hope that people take advantage of it. We're going to have to wrap up. This has been an excellent discussion. And I'm, again, very grateful that all three of you have been a part of it. It sounds to me like the big takeaways are... Uh, that the bad guys are getting more sophisticated. And so we have to have our defenses up even higher. A lot of the basic stuff is the basic stuff and people need to do it and recognize that they can be vulnerable uh, and not just other people. Uh, institutions, businesses uh, need cultures of cyber resilience uh, in order to anticipate what's coming and respond to it, particularly when it happens. Uh, and CSE is happy to help on many of these, these fronts. Um, so thank you again uh, to all of you for being a part of this. Ritesh Kotak is a, a lawyer and cybersecurity expert. Laura Payton is a communications, external communications manager with uh, the communication security establishment. Ian Patterson is CEO of Pluralock, a cybersecurity company. Uh, I want to thank again TELUS for sponsoring this event so that we could have a larger audience for it. And uh, Lee Tynan from TELUS for setting the stage for the conversation. I want to thank all of you uh, for uh, joining us for it. I hope it's been helpful, uh, particularly subscribers. Our subscriber support means the world to us. It is the way we can metaphorically keep the lights on, although it's getting awfully dark around me here in Ottawa for one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you are why we can do our work. Uh, and if you are not already a subscriber, you can find a link to uh, become one in the chat or uh, on the Logic's website, which is at thelogic.co. Uh, I also want to thank the Logic's business team, particularly Ariel Lepper Walker, who uh, you have not seen in this discussion, but who is absolutely central in setting it up. Uh, Jenna Meisner, Amanda Roth, Max Zibai, Armina Marufi, uh, and our technical producer, John Pakman, for all of his behind the scenes work. We have a bunch of upcoming events, which I'll give you a quick rundown of, uh, both virtual and in person, uh, which we've started doing again. Any of you joining us from Kitchener-Waterloo, we are going to be hosting our first ever Waterloo meetup on Thursday, May 4th at the Catalyst Commons. You can save your spot by writing to events at thelogic.co. We had one of these in uh, Ottawa a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was great, packed room, uh, lots of interesting conversations. We're going to be hosting an in-person panel discussion in Toronto, May 15th, uh, on the future of education in Canada. Also, write to events at thelogic.co if you want to be part of that. 
and put a hold in your calendars for Monday, June 26th, if you are in Toronto or planning to be for an event like Collision. Uh, we're going to be hosting our first ever summit there. Uh, we'll be bringing together thought leaders and decision makers for a day of candid discussions about the companies, policies, and people driving transformational change in Canada and beyond. So if you're going to Collision, join us a day early. If you're in Toronto anyway, join us for that. Uh, keep an eye on your inboxes for invites to all these things. Thank you again to everyone who joined us, audience, panel, Lee Tynan, uh, and the, the team that put it all together. You can find The Logic on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks again. Have a great day.